I would like to first uh, mention about the talk that we have uh, up first. Uh, we have the talk called the Anthropocene Maze, an interactive listening experience of our ecological footprint on selected habitats. Um, you can also find the, uh, the paper itself in the, um, the proceedings that have already been made available and uh, you can have a, have a look at, at the paper uh, at your own time. And for now, we would be uh, playing you the presentation that was sent by the authors. So the authors that we have listed on this presentation are Alisa Kobzar, uh, Benedict Brands, Valerian Drack, Jacob uh, Leitner, and... Uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce this name, but I think we have the the person in the in the room. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Uh, but Magnus, do you want to try? How to help me try to say this word? Uh, it's Katerina. Last last name, Katerina. I, don't, I have no uh, idea how. Yes, I think it's Katerina Grossvogt. Uh, Grossvogt. Okay, uh, great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That really, I didn't want to butcher the name. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, uh, the German double S, uh, which looks like a B. Right, right, right. I mean, I'm already learning something at this conference, you see. <laughs> uh, and, and then we have last, we have Clemens Oman. So these are all of our co-authors who have uh, together worked on the Anthropocene uh, Maze uh, paper and we will be watching their video in just a bit. Just, uh, just hang on one more minute. Uh, we, we, can, we can take our time as in, uh, you can we load it up, you can share the screen and then make sure it's running. Okay, we I, I will share it from here. So that should be uh, allow me just one little thing. This. Okay. Um, yes. So we're ready here, and I will share it. I think you can see the uh, the splash screen, right? Yeah. All good. Okay, good to go. I think this is uh, 15 minutes, or just around there. So please enjoy Alice Kopsar's presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alisa Kopsar. I'm a bachelor student of Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics in University of Music and Performing Arts, Graz. First of all, I would like to thank the committee for the amazing possibility to present our paper, The Anthropocene Maze, an interactive listening experience of our ecological footprint on selected habitats. The paper itself is a joint work by Benedict Franz, Valerian Drag, Jakob Leitner, Alisa Kobzar, Katarina Grossvogt, and a result of a group project in the field of sonic interaction design at Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics, IAM, of the University of Music and Performing Arts, Graz, together with Clemens Amon from Johanneum Research. My presentation 
would be divided into several parts. I would start with introducing the concept, then I would briefly speak about the story and storytelling in the maze, then I would move on towards the technical setup followed by a video trailer. The presentation would be concluded by the evaluation of our installation presented in the university campus in July 2021. The Anthropocene maze is an interactive sound installation. The initial idea was inspired by the maze game, the honeycomb maze, where players need to find their way from one room to the next. In our maze, the player moves from one scene to the next and is guided by Ariadne. Concept of Ariadne was chosen as a futuristic navigator with a computer voice that guides through the plot. It fills the gap in the immersive experience as the user cannot, for instance, feel the cold of Arctic or see the surrounding rainforest. The installation consists of a wooden floor equipped with the Pisoflex technology and an ambisonic audio environment. Footstep sounds are modified in the ambience of different habitat soundscapes that suffer from human influence. Ambient sounds support the perception and contextualize the footstep sounds in an immersive audio environment. The time travel, guided by Ariadne, leads from some undefined far future back into the 2021. Five different environments are visited in random order. Glacier, an equoic spacious environment where an iceberg is crashing. For footstep sounds, uh, we have used the harsh steps on gravels. Venice, flooded Venice with seagulls and church bells, as footsteps uh, was used the wading through water. Woods, an idyllic wood which is gradually transformed into a logging place. As footsteps, the crunch on dry leaves on smooth forest soil was used. Tropical forest a rainforest with uh, excited monkeys approaching. For footstep sounds, we have used the wet leaves and puddles. Lab for endangered birds, where the deficient lab equipment plays back incorrect songs that should train birds their forgotten songs. Triggered with the step detection. The footstep sounds we have used the ones on lab floor. Additionally, to these five scenes, the lobby was used in the beginning and in the end. It used a futuristic ambience evoking a large artificial room with a time travel engine. During the creation phase, our team has faced several technical and narrative challenges, among which are how to keep the visitor motivated to stay longer than a few steps on a rather small floor. For that, we introduced the concept of storytelling. How to keep the person engaged and immersed to reveal the whole story? We decided to change the interaction modes and footsteps modifications for each scene. How to switch between the scenes? We used the familiar connotations like the sound of a door opening and the time travel engine sound. Now I would like to introduce the technical setup. The Pisoflex smart floor is roughly 2.2 square meters large and is surrounded by a ring of loudspeakers. The floor consists of six wooden floor tiles, each of them equipped with three single Pisoflex sensors. The sensors are directly integrated in the, the wooden floor tiles for maximum mechanical coupling. This ensures a high sensitivity to structure-borne sound induced by physical interaction on its surface. Around the floor, 10 portable Genelec loudspeakers were mounted as a ring of 6 speakers in 1.5 meters height and 4 speakers placed on each corner of the floor tilted upwards. The software was written in pure data. The ambient sound scenes were prepared with Ripa. To obtain an immersive listening experience, all sound was encoded into third-order ambisonics and decoded onto the current loudspeaker setup. The sound files for the ambient sound 
We have pre-rendered in Reaper using the IAM plugin suite and then loaded and played back automatically by the PD patch. The original single channel footstep sound files were decoded live in Ambisonics using a simple encoder within the PD patch. The sequence of the story was fixed using cue lists with predefined timing. Still, each user experienced a different random order of scenes. In our PD patch we have used two algorithms to generate augmented footstep sound. First, for aggregated surfaces such as gravel, water, dry leaves or mud, we use the overall amplitude of the signal as an envelope for a granular but static sound file. Second, for hard edX we implemented a step detection algorithm that consists of two stages. First, the sensor signals are pre-processed in order to compensate the uh, inexpedient qualities of direct sensor signals. Then, an onset detection algorithm was designed to produce the final triggers. The onset detection was implemented by making use of the bonk object of PD, which incorporates a spectral matching algorithm by Miller Packet. It uses spectral templates in order to detect onsets and pre-recorded files can be used to generate such templates. Since we didn't implement a training stage in our installation, we used the default templates, parameterized the algorithm to our needs with parameters such as attack time and release time, and applied signal pre- and post-processing to fine-tune the detection algorithm. In order to design the immersive ambient space, we tried to implement the idea of proxemic zones. In the public zone, ambient sounds refer to the environment one is in. For instance, rustling on leaves or distant animal scrolls. In the social zone, we may find closer sounds in the ambience. For instance, approaching animals that appear louder, closer, and more narrowly placed in the soundscape. The personal zone relates to the size of the floor. Here we place the step sounds played back from the four bottom loudspeakers. Finally, the intimate zone would be ideal in order to address the listener very personally, such as listening to a monophile over headphones. However, it is harder to realize with a distant ring of loudspeakers. To make Ariadne's voice as intimate as possible, we played her voice back in mono through all our upper channels and reached an omnipresent superior impression of her. In more classic interpretation of film sound design, the proximic zones correspond to layers for background, ambience, mid-ground, steps, special events in the ambience, and foreground, Ariadne. Now, I would like to demonstrate a short video trailer with excerpts from our installation in University Campus. Welcome to the Anthropocene. My name is Ariadne and I will be your guide. We will travel back in time to the year 2021. It's very cold here. What does the forest mean to you? Closer to the young bird's cage, you may hear the forgotten song, which is played back constantly through loudspeakers. Thank you for visiting the Anthropocene maze. tested by dozen passers-by and employees and students of the institute. 
to evaluate the installation, the online survey was conducted and the participants were asked to complete their questionnaire right after leaving. The aim was to learn about their impression of overall experience, aesthetics, immersion, as well as the functionality of the interactive floor. In total, nine participants took part in the survey, as is illustrated on the participants' table, male and female, aged 26, 65. For evaluation, we used open questions as well as rating scale questions with 7-step Likert scale. First, as a central question, we asked the participants under which impression did you leave the installation. As is illustrated on the corresponding graph, the visitors' impressions were mostly positive. Further, we questioned which scenes the participants could remember also checking if the scenes could be correctly identified. The graph shows that on average the participants were able to name three scenes. Then we asked how well the audience was immersed in the experience and how well the system reacted to the footsteps. Finally, the voice of Ariadne and the length of the installation were evaluated. As the graphs show, both were mostly rated suitable. The outside presentation led to some technical problems. For instance, the step detection algorithm of the floor not being on a plane surface was less reliable. Also, we have experienced that the prominent footstep sounds make more impression to the visitors and are remembered better. However, the psychological effect of being outside underneath of real trees even supported the feeling of immersion and naturalness of the sound scenes, as was reported by several visitors. We were happy to meet the positive attitude of people leaving the installation. They were not bored and could follow the whole installation's length. As said before, the Anthropocene maze is a sound installation with a narrative of traveling back to different habitats in 2021 that are increasingly degraded by human influence. Test participants reported that they left with rather pleasant feelings and arousing curiosity. This makes us wonder if it is better to show such a depressing topic in a way that it is still aimable to people, so they like it and stay for the whole story. The positive attitude of people leaving the installation was astonishing to some of the authors. It seems that the depressing topic was relieved by the ambience of natural soundscapes and the neutral voice of Ariadne. For our new presentation in March, we have updated one scene's ambience, implemented some more interaction possibilities in order to better support the narrative and an initially planned game-like atmosphere. We are looking very much forward to our future presentation in March 2022. Thank you for your attention. Very exciting. Let's see, uh, do we have any questions from the room? Um, and, and I think we have uh, a few of the quarters here. So, so please unmute yourself and, and uh, you, have, you would have an opportunity to ask the questions. Uh, can I just check? So we have some of the co-authors in the session, right? Can you... Um... Can we sound check you and can you put your cameras on so we know who you are? Uh, yes. Uh, Jakob Leitner. Can... Yeah, uh, hi. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm Valerian Dweck. Um, I'm studying sound and electrical engineering at the Te Technical University and University of Music and Performing Arts. And it was kind of um, a cool experience to work with um, like interdisciplinary and it was a, a cool, cool group and nice project. 
Valerian, can you explain a little bit what, what was your role in this project? Uh, I mainly uh, was programming and like sound design a little bit and we worked a lot together. But uh, I implemented the step detection and finalized the PT patch. And how, how does the step detection work? Is, I think there were 18 microphones, contact microphones in those um, uh, in the floorboard. Is that that's the pickup? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the pickup. And we sound all channels together. Um, we tried also to to get um, the directions out because we, we have the ambisonic sound system and we can also move around sounds like we want. But it was not enough time to finalize it and it was really hard to test it um, because we didn't have the room all the, all the time. And do you get different? But, um... Uh, do you get different results if you have a, a very heavy person, let's say a grown-up man, or if you have a child on the yes. board? Is it, that yes, must it, be it one was, was, percentage, right? How do you get yes, it, was, it was our first approach to use this kind of bonk um, object, which is um, has been implemented by Miller Bucket. Um, and this would allow to, to make use of kind of spectral templates. So you can pre-record um, step sounds and then use these to, to match and detect them. Um, but we didn't implement like this training series. So it's just this algorithm, but it's yeah very sensitive. Also the sensor signals are very low. You have a lot of noise. And yeah, so it was hard to, to find some, some parameters um, which suit for everyone. And we did a lot of pre-processing and post-processing to, to find some, yeah. some of these. And then we came up with a new idea to just uh, use the envelope and shape some loops, loop sounds. Like for the water, it's it was really cool because you have just water and if if a step goes on then the amplitude of the sound goes on um, so we kind of mixed mixed some stuff but the step detection was necessary to get some interactive parts and yes yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm quite interested in that part of the work, actually, I did something similar, uh, but I used uh, pressure sensors and I had a, mm -hmm. a board so people could step around on a hexagonal plate, which was a wooden board and it was uh, about one meter, one meter ten wide. And uh, so I used six pressure sensors and I just needed to have the direction, you know, the, the angle at, at which they were standing mm -hmm. on the board. Uh, and, and I, I was experimenting with having uh, four or six or eight of these and six turned out to be, let's say, good enough. It was not necessarily better to have more uh, of those yeah. sensors. So did, did you find that, uh, uh, I think, 18 for you, was that optimal? And what, what, what degree of um, precision could you actually get in your system of pickup? Yeah, it, I think it, the sensor layout itself was not optimal. Um, we got the floor, like someone has built it and we used it. But they are like not really good spaced. And I think we also tried it with just a microphone on the floor at home to when we developed the stuff. And that works too. <laughs> so... Yeah. Yeah, you could use less. If I if I may, uh, and if there's no other question, I mean, I, I would definitely encourage others to ask questions. But uh, if I may, I would like to understand uh, the the logic behind the use of Anthropocene in 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 the in the description of the maze, right? Because as a as an uh, engineer and somebody who uh, looks at 
Anthropocene and the environmental impact associated with it. From for me, as as somebody who's just observing, it it almost felt like this was a time capsule uh, that I am sort of going into this period of uh, the Earth where I could, could maybe hear some ecosystems. Was was that the intention? Is is this what it's meant to be? And and then you you had this whole part about gameplay and and. Uh, at the end of the paper, so I was just wondering what, where do you see taking this? I mean, of course, you can expand it to all sorts of ecosystems. That would be beautiful. But yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, it was it was the idea that um, that the impact of um, our hum um, of human on on the on the earth and to, to get in different um, rooms, it was like the idea just to, to play a little bit with sounds and the game game was just so for, for story storytelling so that we have a fixed plan to, to come through the rooms. Or Jakob, do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and hmm. so, hello. Um, yeah, it also actually um, just was by coincidence that we just came to all these scenes and to these specific rooms because we were thinking independently and most of us were thinking of nature and then we had the idea that we could put this together into this story arc and yeah yeah i mean we could you actually as you said you could expand it to any um, environment and actually i think that would be cool also to see other environments and to um yeah, um yeah and to get the impressions of them but yeah i think yeah that's where where we went Thank you. Any other questions from the room? Uh, I'll, I'll take my chances. I have some more questions and uh, they, they go a little bit in the same direction there about the uh, about the nature of storytelling. Um, uh, it'd be great to have uh, uh, Alisa here, but perhaps you can uh, fill us in uh, just a little bit more about how that, uh, how the concept of the narrative uh, was was done in in the uh, twenty twenty one work, and and how you're going to be developing that and making it more interactive uh, in the upcoming version. Uh, specifically, how you, I mean, how does the visitor user go from one environment? to the other what what happens during that shift let's say and can you explain a little bit more um yeah, I, could... I mean i could i could explain how we came to our storytelling but i was not involved in the development for the march presentation so maybe you could take over when you talk about more interactive so um the whole shift part in the original version was just after a set period of time, um, the voice Ariadne said, well, now it's getting too cold or too windy. We have to leave some kind of those stuff. And then a rotating sound came up. And with this rotating sound, the engine moved kind of to the next Place. So actually, yeah, there was not um, um, because of an action the visitor took. So it was all set up actually in a certain time. And I don't know how it is working now. Yeah, we implemented like um, if the on the beginning you the the sound sound is playing. And the start is when we detect the first step, then you are in this lobby and the storytelling starts. 
So this is kind of the first interactive part to start the, the sound installation. But then it's we we rendered all audio and it's the rooms are random, randomly chosen. So that's a thing, but otherwise the, the rooms are fixed in land and fixed in story. So is there any plan of continuing to work on this project or is, is it is this like the end already of your uh of your of your work on this one good question <laughs> yeah we worked a lot um to improve uh, the whole stuff so we put a lot of effort into it that um at moment it it will all works better <laughs> than in the first in the first case. Um, but yeah, let's see how it. There are a lot of ideas which which can be implemented, and we had a lot of ideas, and we tried a lot of stuff. But yeah, in the end, you you have to find something which, what works. And from this part now, we can go can go on. Yeah. But let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. So if if you don't have any other questions, I mean, I, I'll give uh, some more time for the other attendees to think about any questions that they may have uh, before moving on. Because I mean, it's it's great to have uh, Jacob and uh, Valerian here. So yeah. If not, then maybe we go ahead to the next speaker. Uh, so we have uh, two of the co-authors here. So Scott's here. Hi, Scott. Hello. And uh, I am here as well. And and so uh, Scott, you'd be going up first, and then I'll be following up uh, after you. So uh, so whenever you're ready, uh, I'll, I'll let you share the screen. But before that. I'd be a good session chair and let everybody know uh, what is the title of the of the uh, of our talk, and uh, go from there. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see. We can uh, see it. So there's the title. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> um, so the paper covers an art science collaboration among the School of Creative Media, the School of Energy Environment and Hong Kong Observatory. Um, however, it was also part of a 10-year program called Extreme Environments that was running at the School of Creative Media here. The idea was that you would give nature a shared influence in the research and creation of a new media artwork. Uh, the art and design students from our school would go on expeditions to collect on-site data about an endangered remote ecosystem and then transform it into new media artworks that would promote a better understanding of the issues affecting that particular environment. We always partnered with scientific researchers who would share their resources and ensure that the environmental footprint of our students was minimal. So we only joined existing field research stations that were dedicated to the protection of these endangered resources. And these places were in the furthest corner of the planet. Um, when we would get back to Hong Kong, each student would present their interpretation of the data for an exhibition using robotics, generative animation, immersive systems, game design, interactive objects. All of these became forms of a type of 
alternative data visualization. The first trip was in 2012 with an expedition to the Mojave Desert and Death Valley. Students worked with field researchers from UCLA and specialized field stations throughout the desert region. Uh, so the students would collect the same climate data as the scientists, but from a creative perspective. So in Death Valley, this student's dance movements uh, were collected along with wind data along this ridge and reenacted as a robotic installation that showed all the different forces, weather, wind, and so forth on that ridge. In 2014, we worked with a team of Russian physicists and international biologists aboard a polar research vessel in Antarctica. We came back to Hong Kong for an exhibition of the New Media Works that generated quite a bit of buzz here in Asia. And wind was also studied in Antarctica. This is a kite surfing performance that we later recreated with an interactive video that used the same control bar that was used during the performance. Now, this is a very pretty picture, but this is the reality. You have to imagine getting into the water in sub-zero temperatures. There's nine sensors on the student on the kite with another 12 cameras running. Um, this is the camera from the kite. So this is an art student actually collecting data um, and doing research. So, and that's me on the shore looking terrified. <laughs> um, in 2015, we went to a remote jungle cave network in central Vietnam with members of the exploration team that had discovered the site just two years earlier. So we were the first student and artists to ever see any of these amazing underground formations. We lived in complete darkness for days underground and the team created lighting effects, projections, uh, scientific sensors readings, and some amazing sound installations due to the echoes that were present. 2017, we worked with the scientists from the Nature Conservancy in a remote corner of the Coral Triangle, and we assisted in the birth and the survival of the rare hawksbill turtles. Uh, the students assisted in four separate hatchings. We also trained eight of our art students to become certified divers, and they worked with underwater scientists from the State Key Laboratory on marine pollution in the stunning reefs um, of Sipadan, Malaysia as well as studying the huge amount of wrecks that were in the area. All of these sort of became a highly regarded experiment in discovery-based education. And we are the only art school to connect its students with the most inaccessible sites on the planet. So how is an artist doing research at a site different than a scientist? Uh, well, a scientist works to remove himself, his influence, from the experiment's results, but art is the opposite. The artist's point of view and their presence is the most important part of the experiment. So with new media artworks, you get, the, you get both. You get the environment and the artist's reaction and interaction becoming part of the project. So it's a more relational understanding of these sites. Plus students have to learn how to perform readings and collect accurate data in a range of intense climate conditions. And then once back at the school, they have to cover weeks of ana analyzing the data to determine which visualization strategy will best present the scientific findings. And the school is very well situated for this. We have a lot of cool toys like 360 degree theaters. We have these round portable domes. Um, so students really exploited all the technologies available to them. In 2018 though, one of the worst typhoons in history ripped through Asia. Uh, <clears throat> amazingly, only a few people were killed, but the damage was incredible. Hong Kong alone lost over 40,000 trees in three hours. And when it was over, I was contacted by Hong Kong Observatory and asked if our program would do a version on the city itself, if we would treat Hong Kong as an extreme environment. And what's interesting is at the same time, Dr. Chopra was also contacted regarding the transportation issues that occurred immediately following this disaster. Now, HKO has a massive 
collection of images, uh, data, graphics, videos that go all the way back to 1883. So you've got over a century of data on cloud movement, wind, storms, pollutants, lightning strikes. Plus right now they have real-time sensors all over the, the SAR um, constantly reading the environment. And they gave us full access to all their data. So for example, these are two separate data sets that we stacked on top of each other. One was just air traffic from the airport and the other was meteorological data of a storm coming in from the mainland. By putting the two together, now you can see the panic and the desperation in these flights. So by layering, you start to see the story, the human relationship within the data. Our students immediately started playing with all these images and all these different sets. So these are stacked satellite photos that show a very powerful story about the development of Hong Kong. If you look in the lower left, you can see amazingly how quickly we built that airport. <laughs> so um, a wide range, um, well, after the typhoon, a local nonprofit began collecting all the fallen trees and was looking for ways to reuse the wood. So we upcycled the fallen trees from the typhoon for both the exhibition construction and individual artworks. The students visualized the typhoon data with dozens of emerging technologies, and several of them are detailed in the paper. We also created a wide range of real-time and historical weather data that we visualized into short films that became a sensation to thousands of school children when HKO had their open house here in Hong Kong. The students on the project also designed a full branding campaign, posters, postcards, catalog, and a website. And the exhibition at the Tycoon Center for Heritage and Arts was a major success. We had over two to 3,000 international guests over three days, raising awareness and a deeper understanding of our city's relationship, our complex relationship with nature. The School of Creative Media hosts the websites for every expedition, including the data, personal statements, process, documentation, and final artworks. The last video I'm gonna show you is this one. Um, and it's based on the capacity numbers at the train stations, the MTR subway stations, the day after ty the typhoon. Now, all of the other modes of transportation in Hong Kong were completely ruined because of the fallen trees. So the train network became completely flooded with people. And using those statistics, we visualized the entire Hong Kong MTR network as these blood vessels, as these veins. And you can actually see the expansion of the network. And this brings us to Dr. Shora Chopra's topic about warning systems that are, follow extreme weather. So thank you very much. And I will pass this over to Dr. Chopra. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So you just perfectly like alley you me for like a dunk, right? So, uh, well, what I do is uh, work on the understanding the uh, resilience of cities and how do we make cities more resilient to these extreme weather events. Uh, I take a very uh, uh, engineering perspective, as, as mentioned, and I am mostly interested in looking at the data to inform uh, decisions by either the public in terms of how they should be best uh, prepared uh, and uh, should be responding to these kinds of disruptions. And also from the public administration side, which is basically uh, the Hong Kong government and, and their uh, uh, no notifications to uh, the, uh, the public. And so my whole angle was very, very fresh in, in a way to, for me, because I had never thought of getting uh, artists to look at the same kind of data that I look at and let them sort of visualize it and see what they can come up with. So my role was very small in this. I was, I was just helping make a scientific uh, sense of the data that was available 
to the students. And so that's that's the beauty of this project because what we did was we we let the students take the data from HKO uh, and make uh, art pieces or works that could communicate the urgency associated with climate uh, climate change and the various impacts that it causes. So I'll give you some of, some of the ex examples of the artworks and what kind of data they use. So here is one of the first ones that we have. This is actually a window as it's called by Kalok Veskershek. So he, uh, Vesker, what he decided was he wanted to use the data from the wind speed and air pressure from Typhoon Mongkut, right? And this Typhoon is really the one of the, uh, the strongest that have ever hit Hong Kong. Uh, so in, in, a, in a way, this, this uh, system was actually looking at how a human would actually feel the pressures and wind by just looking at a screen. And then this is actually a visualization. Uh, in the in the interest of time, I'll just show you a few of these visualizations. But uh, here is another example of uh, using weather data. Here, instead of using data from Typhoon Mongkut, what uh, what uh, GZV focused on was using uh, the number of hot days in a particular calendar year as a measure of climate change, and it, it was it was a simple but insightful visualization that say, of course, I could produce a, a bar chart for, but it, does, it wouldn't have the same immersive effect. And eventually that's what we wanted to test. So that's why we did this service. So let me show you uh, what did the exhibition goers actually saw when they were present at Taikun. And so you can see, uh, the number of ice, I, I actually shouldn't be talking. You should just see it. <laughs> and so we're getting into the 60s. And now you can see the frying. <laughs> right, so that, that was an example of how uh, extreme heat was visualized in, in a particular uh, sense, which would, which would not be otherwise very clearly uh, shown in, in a bar chart, or not, not connect with at least the public. In the same way, we, we had uh, another uh, uh, art piece by Martin. Martin is the same person who made the, uh, the MTR veins uh, previously that you saw. And so in this case, he, he wanted to interpret the uh, HKO's wind stations uh, data. And uh, so, so again, this, this was all uh, uh, real time information being converted from the wind stations into this visualization. I'll give you another example here. Uh, Andy Schaub, actually all of these students were from four different uh, continents. I mean, this was like a very international group of students. So uh, this, this particular student decided to look at the, uh, how, how the data, wind data set for Typhoon Mongkut impacts uh, the lullaby as it is played uh, with the intensity of the, uh, uh, the intensity of the typhoon getting uh, higher. Well, I'm not sure if I'm sharing sound, so let me make sure that I do.
so you get the idea, right? Like how uh, the wind data was uh, manipulating the the sound of the the lullaby just to uh, inform the intensity of the uh, the storm uh, that we were uh, facing. So what we did was we wanted to understand whether any of this actually translated in uh, better climate change communication for the uh, exhibition goers. So we administered a survey. It was a 10 question survey uh, at the Taekwon Center for Heritage and Art in Hong Kong. And uh, this uh, out of the 10 questions, I'm just going to show you two results. Uh, so first, we wanted to check, do you think the Hong Kong government needs better visualizations to inform you about climate change impacts such as typhoons, extreme heat and rising sea levels. And we got a, uh, a resounding yes for 78%. Uh, so we had 180 uh, folks who had taken this uh, uh, survey and we got a resounding yes. And, and when we wanted to look at the post uh, effect of uh, the exhibition on the exhibition goer, what was the impact on whether it actually has an impact on the public? Well, we, we didn't get again a resounding yes, where we say, uh, we asked, do you think art can help you understand the effects of typhoons, extreme heat and other negative impacts? And, and th that was again, quite promising. Uh, this is, uh, quite useful, especially for uh, Hong Kong, because there weren't any Hong Kong specific data sets on uh, explaining whether they are, there is a behavioral change uh, associated with uh, people uh, using um, new media art as a way of climate change communication and data visualization. And uh, that, was, that was quite, quite impactful, I feel. So in, just to conclude, uh, what we did was we had an interdisciplinary co collaboration between art and science educators to train artists. And, and this is uh, extremely important because uh, what we did here was to uh, not only provide them with, uh, of course, the training that Scott provides, but also helping them see uh, and understand data sets that uh, would, would be interesting for them to then visualize. Uh, also, this is quite important of uh, an area given the urgency associated with climate change and the need for behavioral uh, behavioral shift in, in the way that we uh, are consuming and producing uh, in the built environment. Uh, student artists used weather data to create emotive immersive visualizations and, and they were received very well. Uh, the artistic visualizations of extreme events, uh, if, uh, data, was also shown to be effectively uh, communicating the, the main threats of the various environmental impacts that they were causing, right? So uh, we had extreme heat to typhoons uh, and we had other, uh, other kinds of precipitation events as well uh, represented at the exhibition. And finally, uh, we received positive engagement with public as public raises awareness to build uh, urban resilience, which actually was, was 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 the main takeaway. Because after that, HKO uh, has been quite interested in HKO is the uh, Hong Kong Observatory, very interested in uh, recreating or or utilizing some of these uh, uh, artworks in communicating and. Uh, and putting some of these uh, artworks in, onto the YouTube channel, you know, even they, they, they're interested in these kinds of things. And this is quite uh, important uh, for, for them to understand that there is another route than actually just showing God's eye view of these maps with, with, uh, with spatial data or wind data or precipitation data that does not really get the, uh, the, uh, the citizen, the resident of the city to actually change their behavior. So that's uh, why we think such climate change communication efforts through uh, data visualization uh, would, would be uh, something that should be further encouraged, especially in a city like Hong Kong. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to acknowledge our co-author, Kayo Chang Black, and our venue, and all of the students here uh, who had uh, 
participated in the setup of the exhibition and our various uh, funding organizations. So thank you. Uh, and I'm sure Scott and I would be happy to answer any questions. All right. Um, let's see if we have any questions here. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, great uh, presentation. There's a lot of really interesting pieces. Uh, I'm curious to know if there's been any dialogue with the municipal organization since the exhibitions and projects have been going on and if there's been any kind of um, like progress forward in creating resilience and um, sort of updating approaches. Scott, do you want to take that one? Um, I can start it, but I think in terms of resilience, it might be better you. Uh, individual projects got singled out and would be pursued by the government. Uh, for example, one of the students was doing earthworks using um, human bone matter um, as underground bases for coral. And the government right away picked up on that because Hong Kong has a lot of dying coral yet also has no space for cemeteries. So right away, her project was in the government being looked at as a potential for sort of creating these coral, coral gardens that would also serve as cemeteries for Hong Kong. So individual projects got studied very closely. Um, on a larger scale, you know, Hong Kong Observatory, what Xiao Rat was saying, suddenly realized the value in something like this. And that's really the first step is getting scientists to realize that an artist can do more than, than, than just present a, a spreadsheet or a bar chart. And that that level of emotion and personal engagement can really move forward. So because of that, I think more and more projects like this will start getting funded by Hong Kong but also with other municipalities that we've worked with in the past 10 years. Um, in terms of resilience, Sharon? Yeah, no, I actually, uh, to, make, to further elaborate on the HKO point, uh, we, we got quite a bit of interest from HKO. And I, I think even when me and Per Magnus met for DACA, uh, we heard from HKO about uh, how they were uh, very much interested in participating and providing data for more of such uh, data visualization and data interpretation uh, uh, artworks to be created. I mean, so they're, they're willing to provide that uh, space, provide the resources. Uh, and, and I think down the line, I think it'll, it'll also mean that there will be some space for those visualizations and artworks to be exhibited in say public, uh, infrastructure uh, like uh, say MTR, the, so that's the metro system, right? The subway system or, or the or other sort of uh, screens that the city doesn't have a shortage of, right? We have enough screens to put all of our artworks up there to get those, uh, uh, to convey some of these points without beating uh, you on the head with policy, right? Like maybe through some immersive art. Yeah, it's a sort of interesting dance between the demands of the public and the actual actions of the infrastructure builders, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the, the infrastructure builders and providers in this case, most likely are uh, uh, companies that are related to the government. Uh, so say for example, the public transportation system is of course, all of these are private companies but they have uh, you know, a, a lot of support from the government in, uh, in one way or the other. So, so the government can actually uh, get uh, these uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure providers to exhibit some of these uh, artworks to further the point about communicating uh, what to do at a, in, a, in a situation. Um, you know, we haven't even gotten to the point of like talking about uh, 
disaster notifications because Hong Kong has a very elaborate way of notifying of uh, typhoons. Uh, there's very interesting, uh, rich history of the symbols associated with uh, with typhoons and the, this is the degree of typhoon. But uh, with with respect to say more newer environmental impact problems such as uh, sea level rise or or even uh, extreme heat and how do we provide that information in real time and those those are open questions and uh, how do we communicate it to people and how to get them to change behavior or patterns of consumption is is very interesting but open-ended i'd like to but, add on to that too that hong kong is very focused on its urban signature in the sense that we are in a very very densely populated city and we have the lot highest level of light pollution in the world. So the city is always looking for ways to inform the public without adding yet another flashing LED screen at them. Uh, we already kind of live in a Blade Runner environment here. So a lot of these projects were sort of an ambient recognition of how can you alert people and notify people of changes in an environment like this without it being just another screen lighting up on the building in front of them. Oh. And it's interesting that several of these projects have been used in further grants that the government is looking at in terms of sort of an ambient awareness type of information signatures and warning signatures in a city like this. Great question, by the way. Maybe I'll, I'll venture a question there, and uh, in particular for the extreme environments uh, pedagogical project that uh, Scott was leading. So, are, are you planning to continue this? Is is there some some way of uh, pursuing this in this line? I don't know. Um, we've had a change in focus at the university, and it's less related now to experiential education as it was for a while there. So, a lot of it was. International experiential education was a thrust at our school, and now there's been a shift. Um, obviously, also, travel is impossible right now, um, so that hurts us as well. The other issue, too, is that there's a huge amount of logistics issues involved in it. So it was always, it wasn't just me, it was always a large team, so the resources are very hard to corral, and you know, we keep getting invitations. Um, I get contacted still every year from people around the world wanting to bring our students there and do a similar program. But unfortunately, the environment right now is just impossible to do it. So it's hard to say. You know, you're asking me to predict the post-COVID world. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. I feel like I was very lucky to see these places on the planet because if it were happening right now, it would not be possible. I will add that we just published an extensive paper in SSI, which is a SAGE publication, on exactly how to do this. It's sort of a cookbook on how we did the medical, how we did visas, how we did the budgets, how we did fundraising, um, how we actually did international travel, how the students traveled, all of it. And I'm hoping that even if it's not possible in Hong Kong in the future, that someone else will read that paper and be able to follow the steps almost exactly the same to launch this program somewhere else in the world. So I don't think it's over. It may not resurface in Hong Kong in the same form, but I know that other people in the planet are looking at this now, realizing that if you have the right constellation of government and university and student, that it could be done virtually anywhere. So I hope so, yes, for Magnus. Well, I think uh, 
if we don't have any questions, we are actually out, out of time for this session. Um, and we will see you all in 15 minutes. And uh, so that's when we will have the next set of talks. So looking forward to those talks and looking forward to having you back. See you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.